Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is Cournot competition. These are situations where firms are competing over quantities, how much of a good to produce. As I mentioned in the introduction to the series, economists love naming things after the people who first studied them. So we call competition over quantities Cournot competition, named after this man right here. Let's go ahead and start analyzing the type of model that he first looked into way back in the 1800s. And there's a lot to digest, so I want you to take a deep breath and let's go through this one step at a time. In Cournot competition, firms simultaneously choose quantities of production. That simultaneous caveat is super important. This is what distinguishes Cournot competition from Stackelberg competition. In Cournot competition, we have simultaneous moves. In Cournot competition, we have sequential moves, where firm one makes a decision, then firm two makes a decision. We'll study Stackelberg later on. Here, we're just focused on that simultaneous case. And because we're studying duopolies by and large in the series, we just have two firms here, firm one and firm two. So firm one and firm two simultaneously choose production quantities, which we'll call Q1 and Q2. These are some values that are greater than or equal to zero. So for example, firm one might choose to produce 50 goods, firm two might choose to produce 60 units of that same good, and so Q1 would be equal to 50, Q2 would be equal to 60. We have a bound of zero here because it doesn't make sense for a firm to produce a negative quantity of a good. This is all the firms choose in this game. They're just producing some quantity, and that is the only choice that they make. But there's still a lot more detail to go into the model because what a firm wants to choose to produce is going to depend on some other components. One of those components is the price that they'll be able to get on the market. In this style of model, we think about the good that is being produced as homogenous. So consumers aren't caring where the good is coming from, whether it's firm one or firm two producing it. They just care about getting the good itself. So you might think about this as nails or screws. Firm one and firm two are producing a bunch of nails and consumers are out there trying to buy nails. So the way that the price is going to be set by the market is not going to depend on the identities of the firms, but rather the total quantity of the goods out there. So that value will denote as Q without a subscript. Of course, Q is equal to Q1 plus Q2. The price function is taking Q as an input and it's outputting a price P. You can think of a lot of functional forms that would work like that, but it turns out that in microeconomics sequences, there's a very common functional form used. You'll often see the functional form of A minus Q for the price. So that's what we're going to be looking at here. And there's a lot to take in with that. So what is this A minus Q thing? Well, we have A being some sort of constant. You can think about this as the consumer out there that cares the most about this good what is that consumer willing to pay? That is kind of what alpha is representing here. And then you subtract out Q, and that is your price. So because we have a negative Q, this is giving us our intuitive fact that as the quantity is being increased, we have the price going down. That's simple supply and demand. When the market is flooded with the good, in order for the market to clear, the price needs to go down. Of course, you run into a problem here where if the quantity produced is very, very large, we might end up having negative prices. So the way that we'll account for that here is just by saying that the price is A minus Q as long as Q is less than A. And when Q is larger than A, then we'll have it be equal to zero. So the price will have a floor of zero. Okay, that takes care of the price function. The last thing that we have to worry about is marginal costs. So the marginal costs of production are going to be CI greater than or equal to zero. So firm one's marginal cost is C1, firm two's marginal cost is C2. Sometimes you'll see versions of this sort of problem where the firms have identical marginal costs. If that's the case, then you can just make C1 equal to C2 equal to just some value C. Another thing to note here is that it doesn't matter how many of a good the firm is producing, the firm is going to pay the same amount for the first unit of the good as it would pay for the 50th unit of the good. 
In this game, the firms are going to have an objective of maximizing profit, just like you would have in a standard economic situation. So nothing really odd there. That profit function is the price times the quantity of a particular firm minus that firm's marginal cost times the quantity that they produced. Again, pretty straightforward. So to recap here, we have each firm simultaneously choosing a quantity of production and each of these firms trying to maximize the profit function that you have as the last line on your screen. Now we need to think about solving this. How do we go about doing that? Well, we have a three-step process. The first step is going to be to derive firm one's best response to firm two's output decision. So imagine that you are the CEO of firm one and you have your business analysts deciding that, hey, we know that firm two is going to produce this amount. Well, a best response function is what tells that CEO how much to produce in response to any possible report coming back from that company. We'll do the same thing for firm two. What is firm two's best response to firm one's output decision? What is the quantity produced for firm two that will maximize firm two's profit for any given quantity produced from firm one? And then once we have those two things, we're going to find a pair of output decisions that are mutual best responses. In other words, outputs that each firm is happy to produce given that they know that the other firm is going to produce some quantity. For example, if firm one is producing 50 goods because 50 is the best thing that it could produce in response to firm two producing 60 goods, then 50 is the best response to 60. And if firm two is producing 60 goods because 60 goods is the best thing to produce in response to firm one producing 50 goods, then 60 is the best response to 50. And this is an equilibrium point. This is stable. No one wants to change the quantities produced given what the other one is doing. What's interesting to note here is that this is essentially a Nash equilibrium. And Cournot was working with what we now call Nash equilibria way back in the 1800s, even though Nash wouldn't formalize this until after World War II. Okay, now that we can get through this solution strategy, let's just go through it one step at a time. Let's start with the first point. Let's derive firm one's best response. So firm one has a best response function. How are we going to get that? Well, first, we're going to start off by thinking about what it's trying to maximize. It's maximizing its profit function, which is the price times its own quantity minus its marginal cost times its quantity. Okay, well, we know that the price is equal to A minus Q. And we know that Q is equal to Q1 plus Q2. This is, again, assuming that we're not going to have negative prices, which will be fine because in equilibrium, as long as we meet certain conditions, we won't have to worry about that. So after we substitute Q as being Q1 plus Q2, we can do some distribution, making sure that we distribute the negative sign as well. And we have firm one's profit function if we go through this to make it a little bit simpler for when we need to apply a derivative, that's what firm one's best response function is going to come from. This is its profit. And so the way that we're going to try to maximize our profit is to figure out what value of Q1, because we're firm one, we're choosing a quantity one, a Q1. What is the Q1 that maximizes this quantity? So to visualize what's going on here, what I have done is plotted this function which is again, the last thing that was on the previous screen, setting A equal to 16, choosing Q2 equal to five. So this is just hypothetically supposing that firm two were to produce five units of the good and having firm one's marginal cost be one. What you see is a function that is non-monotonic. It starts out increasing and it eventually decreases. You will notice that when Q1, which is the x-axis here, when that is equal to zero, Firm one does not make any profits whatsoever. That makes sense because if it's not producing anything, it can't profit. But it's also the case that if it floods the market, it will not profit either. That's because the price is going to go down, down, down. And so at some point, it's just not going to be profitable at all to produce that amount of goods. So firm one's best response is the value of Q1 that is maximizing this function. Well, the way that we can find that 
is by trying to figure out where the derivative of this function is equal to zero. Where the derivative of this function is equal to zero, well, that is this flat tangent point up top, and that is the value that is as high as it gets. So we can use what we know about calculus and derivatives and optimization to use derivatives to find where this tangent line is equal to zero, and where that tangent line is equal to zero is the quantity that is maximizing our profit. So this is what we call a first order condition, where we're taking the derivative of that profit function and setting it equal to zero. This is the same thing as where the marginal cost equals the marginal profit. It's the same sort of thing that's going on here. Okay, well, if we set that equal to zero, then, and after that, we do a little bit of rearranging, we get that Q1 is equal to A minus Q2 minus C1 divided by two. For any given value Q2 that firm two could choose, firm one's best possible Q1 quantity is going to be that. Again, with the caveat that Q1 has to be at least zero. So if this is positive, that's what they are choosing. And if Q2 is so large that this value of Q1 becomes negative, then firm one will just produce zero instead. A couple of comparative statics to note here. Firm one's optimal quantity decreases in both firm two's output and its own marginal cost. The comparative static with the marginal cost is pretty straightforward. When something is more costly for you to produce, it should be straightforward that you would want to produce less of it. The reason that firm one's optimal quantity decreases when firm two's output increases is due to a second order consequence. When firm two's quantity is going up, that means that the profits available to firm one are going down because the price is not going to be as large. And so firm one responds by reducing its output. And just to plot things again here, this is the best response function. So on the x-axis, we have Q2. And what we are looking at here is what firm one is going to want to produce in response to any Q2. Again, with A equal to 16, and C1 equal to one. So for example, if we take a look at what six is equivalent to, so if you're looking at about six, then firm one is going to produce something like four and a half or five goods. And we're doing this with continuous values, of course, so that we can have smooth answers with our derivatives. We're not too worried about having discrete values of the good that could be produced. Okay. So we have derived firm one's best response. That was the first step in solving this. The second step is solving for firm two's best response. But it turns out that this is essentially the same sort of problem that we were studying beforehand, where now all we're doing is flipping every instance of a subscript of one to two and every instance of a subscript of two to one. It's the exact same procedure. And if we do that, then firm two's best response is going to be A minus Q1 minus C2 divided by two. Again, with a caveat that that has to be positive, otherwise it would choose zero. And once more, we note that firm two's optimal quantity decreases in both firm one's output and its own marginal cost for the same intuition that we were looking at previously. Okay, so we have derived firm one's best response. We have derived firm two's best response. The last thing to do was to try to figure out a mutual best response. So to derive the equilibrium of this game, what do we need to do? Well, first, let's think about this. Firms are in equilibrium when each does not want to change what it is doing given the other firm's strategy. As such, a pair of Q1 and Q2 values such that both of the best response functions are holding simultaneously, well, that's an equilibrium. You might think that that's going to be rather hard to get at, but in fact, this is straightforward. You just have to recall a little bit of high school algebra to do this. This is a system of two equations with two unknown variables. And because these are unique equations, we can actually solve for them, and then we'll be done. One little piece here that might be puzzling is that you might think that we have more than two unknown variables, because if you look at the variables that we have out there, we have an A, we have a Q1, we have a Q2, we have a C1, and we have a C2. So there are five different variables there. But in fact, only two of them are actually being chosen. 
A is given to us, C1 is given to us, C2 is given to us. A is just some value out there in the world that is the price function. C1 is your marginal cost. C2 is the other firm's marginal cost. Those things are just fixed. The only things that can change are Q1 and Q2. Those are the only endogenous components to this model. And so because we only have two variables that are actually unknown, we can solve for this. All right, so let's do that. This is going to involve a lot of algebra, but it's not actually that difficult. So we have these as our best response functions. Let's go ahead and take Q2 from the right and put that as the Q2 in the left. So all I'm doing is making a simple substitution procedure. And then through each of these consecutive bullet points, I'm doing a little bit of simplifying, first by multiplying out all of the denominators so we don't have to worry about fractions. And then I'm collecting all of the Q1 terms on one side. If we want to solve for Q1, because now that we've eliminated Q2 from here, it's the only thing we can solve for. And once we do that, we have Q1 equal to A plus C2 minus 2C1 divided by 3. That is what firm 1 is going to produce in equilibrium. And then it's the same procedure for firm 2. Again, all we're doing now is flip-flopping the 1s and the 2s and the subscripts. And when you do that, we get Q2 equal to A plus C1 minus 2C2 divided by 3 couple of comparative statics to note here, you will see that firm 2's output, how much it is producing, is going to increase in firm 1's cost. Why is that? Well, if firm 1 has a higher marginal cost, firm 2 is seeing this as a source of weakness from firm 1, and so firm 2 is more confident that it can produce lots of stuff and still be able to profit off of it because it is expecting firm 1 to scale back its production. On the other hand, firm 2 is going to decrease its output as its marginal cost increases for the intuitive reason. It costs more to produce and wants to produce less. Okay, so again, we have now solved for the equilibrium of this where we have Q1 and Q2 as the last parts of these equations. And what we're going to do now in the next series of lectures is study some interesting facets of Cournot competition. We've done the grunt work, so to speak, of solving for the equilibrium. Now we can start doing some analyzing and see who's profiting and where there might be some sort of gains that the firms can make, perhaps by collaborating with one another. Hope you enjoyed this. Hope to see you next time. Take care.